Wow. It is wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord today. Um, as uh, my brother Daryl has said, it's, it's a pretty historic event. Uh, actually, two years ago, uh, to this Sunday, uh, my wife and I actually joined Harvest Bible Fellowship Church. So you can give a round of applause for that. Uh, also, we, we, we joined Harvest Bible Fellowship on her birthday. So um, October 16th was her birthday, and today's the 14th, but it was still that Sunday. So um, could I have my, my, my beautiful wife stand, please? We're not going to sing happy birthday, but I want to acknowledge the woman who's been praying for me, who's been loving on me, who's been enduring all the late nights. She's been my guinea pig. Baby, did you, did you get something from what I said? <laughs> and so I, uh, I praise God for her. I, I wouldn't be here without her prayers and love and support. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all my friends and family who came out from uh, near and far. It's really blessing to see all your uh, beautiful faces here. Um, where are my parents at? I appreciate you guys and your encouragement as well. I love you. Um, but there is a word for us. There is a word for us. Um, my text will come from Ephesians chapter 5. If you want to uh, go ahead and turn there. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Be Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. If you will please stand. The word of God says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. Uh, blessing to the hearers, readers, and doers to God's holy word. You may be seated. This is a tough passage, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to give you a brief imagery before we dive in to the text. As a kid, I grew up uh, in DeSoto, and, and, and uh, like, like most kids, we uh, needed a nightlight, you know, to, to keep away uh, those, those fears of the boogeyman or the fears of uh, just tripping over something in the middle of the night, you know, so you can get up and go use the restroom. You know, this night lighted. It gave me confidence. It gave me uh, assurance that I wouldn't uh, be uh, attacked by those shadows that, you know, were in the corner or whatever. But one thing I noticed about these things was when, when I began to grow up, the uh, nightlight became something of what little kids have. You know, it's, it's something that I wanted to graduate from because I no longer needed it anymore. Uh, I was so familiar with my surroundings. I was so comfortable uh, moving around in the darkness that uh, I was able to navigate to my destination and anywhere that I wanted to go at ease. And I found a comfort from maturing in darkness. And I think that the Ephesian church is being encouraged 
by Paul to remember what their purpose is and to not and to not move away from the purpose of Jesus Christ in their life because of the surrounding culture. See, one night when I was uh, sleeping, I had gotten so comfortable in the darkness that I began to sleepwalk. I was that comfortable. My, my body, incoherent, I mean my mind, incoherent, I still was able to get to the destination that I was uh, wanting to do because it, it, it had been such a regular practice. And so I'm uh, walking, dragging my hand along the wall, uh, sleepwalking, and little did I know, I didn't end up in the bathroom. I ended up in the kitchen. And my parents are there, and he says, uh, uh, well, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm actually getting ready to you know, use the restroom. He said, boy, you're not in the bathroom. Wake up. And so I groggily, I, I wake up, and he points me in the right direction. And uh, so, but, but that's what can happen uh, when, you are, when you are so comfortable in darkness. You don't realize where you're going. You don't realize that you're going in the wrong direction. You feel sincerely that this is normal, that this is how you should be walking. But in the end, you may end up going in the wrong place. And I don't want you to do that. So you may be comfortable in your surroundings, in the culture, and what's popular. I want to encourage you to allow God's word to point you in the direction of your true purpose. The title is Know Your Purpose, A Call to Live Out Your Created Purpose in Christ. Verse 1 and 2. Well, before we dive into that, I, 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 want, I want you to uh, know the, 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 the context of the people who we're talking about. Because these aren't just uh, some, some, some country people who don't know anything about uh, anything. These are some very prominent people, you know, who, who have it all together, so to say. Um, in Ephesus, they were one of the largest and wealthiest cities in the Roman Empire. Uh, They had a large system of aqueducts, uh, which enabled them to transport millions of gallons of water into the city uh, to to sustain a population of nearly a million people. Uh, And this is in the ancient world. So they had running water. Uh, Since this ancient city had running water, uh, a lot of people wanted to go there because they didn't have to worry about waste or it stinking. So it was one of the uh, cleanest places ever in the ancient world. It was a primary port of trade for, uh, for, for Asia Minor. It was located by a lot of land routes, and so it was easily accessed uh, to, to, to people from uh, the sea and land. It was a place to be. It was a place to go. They also had massive libraries that had over uh, 12,000 scrolls, so these people knew a lot. You know, they're, they're, they're technologically advanced. They... They are advanced in philosophy and how you should live your life. Uh, and, and, and they had a 25,000 seat amphitheater, so the entertainment was banging, the entertainment was booming. I mean, it was concerts every night. You know, it was plenty of things to go to and do uh, to, to fulfill themselves and, and to be entertained and to fulfill every need. And the most popular attraction in Ephesus is uh, the Temple of Artemis, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. Now, the Temple Artemis is also known as the Temple of Diana, the, uh, the goddess of reproduction, of, of, of fertility, and, and basically the uh, ritual for honoring this deity is, is, uh, is ritual prostitution. And so, you know, like how we would probably go watch the football game after church uh, or, or after you leave the store. You know, people would stop by the temple, you know, and, 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 and enjoy that free buffet that they have. You know, some of y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and so they had these uh, trading cards. You know, they were like uh, pictures that you would uh, trade of this deity in... Uh, illicit 
sexual positions and they were, they were like trading cards and, and people and people bought them. And uh, so so these are the people that Paul is addressing this message to. They had the motto of whatever happens in Ephesus stays in Ephesus. Uh, it was the place to be for high learning, trade, public entertainment, private entertainment, and living there gave you plenty of reasons to boast in the power of mankind and his achievements. And there was a small body of believers located in the midst of all of this. Paul wrote to this church to encourage them all that they have to boast about Christ and not about how great this culture is, how great uh, of, of ease we get to live versus the other ancient world who are still hitting each other with sticks for entertainment. But in verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. When you see the word therefore, you have to ask wherefore. So we're going to look at the things Paul was encouraging the church about prior to this main section that he's trying to talk to. He's saying in chapter 1, all the spiritual blessings that are theirs in Christ Jesus. Like he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Amen. So that's, that's a great thing to boast about that, you, you, that we don't have to grasp on the, the greatness there, but you have significance, oh, I'm sorry, you, you have significance because of who you are in Christ and how he loves you and how he wants you. Right. Yes. And you don't have to feel like, you're alone or, uh, or, or cast off because uh, when you tell your friends that you can't make it to the temple and they shun you, all hope is not lost because your hope is in Christ. Amen. And uh, he continued to encourage them. He said, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses and according to the riches of his grace. So even though that... Uh, these people lived there, they actually used to engage in these sins. They actually used to do the, 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 the temple practices and all the things that would cause shame uh, from, from coming to the light. And he's saying, you can be redeemed. And I think that's a word for you today. Amen. So no matter what your background is, you can be redeemed. Amen. Your situation is not irredeemable. But we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That's good news. In chapter 2, he explained how they were saved by grace through faith and are now reconciled in Christ, both Jews and non-Jews. So it wouldn't just be uh, white people being saved. It wouldn't just be black people or Hispanic or just Asian people being saved. But we all have redemption through Christ. We all have the grace that comes from the reconciliation and the blood of Jesus Christ. Everybody. So nobody has to feel ostracized. No, then it doesn't have to be an elite culture kind of thing with us. Not in the body of Christ. It shouldn't be. That's what Paul is encouraging them. He shared the mystery of the good news of Jesus Christ and prayed for their spiritual strength. They were dealing with many dark things. They were dealing with many temptations that were that that would cause them to lose their jobs and social statuses. I mean, they were getting persecuted for their faith. They were getting killed for this good news that we're talking about. Amen. Killed. Some of these things are detailed in, in Acts chapter 19. Uh, how 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 when you can allow your light to shine for God. And it can cause the people who are living in darkness to create an uproar and say, man, how dare you tell me how to live? How dare you tell me that I need to stop doing this or stop doing that? In chapter 4, he continued to encourage them to be unified because, hey, you need each other. We need to support each other. 
especially when you, you live in a, 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 a culture that, that wants to get rid of God and, and, wants to, yeah. and, and wants to create these barriers to nobody can learn. And uh, let me just think about this. You know, we spend 12 years in, in school uh, where we're not allowed to bring up the gospel, where we're not allowed to talk about the Bible. And so it can cause you to have a spiritual dormancy like you're used to putting your Bible down and, and, and being careful. Oh, I can't say this. And so Paul is encouraging them that you need to trust Christ. These are your spiritual blessings. Uh, point one, imitating Christ is the believer's main source of power. Imitating Christ is the believer's main source of power. What did Christ do? He loved. Christ loved us. Uh, his love was one of humility and selflessness. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 8, it highlights these characteristics. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he, in, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. We see here that Jesus was definitely not living his best life. He wasn't. He just wasn't. I mean, just think, if you God and you can do all things and do all these at your whim, you can have this, you can have that, you can create this, you can create that. He instead chose to empty himself instead of enjoy all the things that he could. And Paul, in this letter to the Philippians, is saying, you need to have a mind like Jesus. You need to have a mindset like him, right? So I know, I know the best life concept is, 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 is popular, but you will, you will spend your life uh, discontent, bitter, and probably angry at God if you think that you're supposed to have everything that everybody else around you has. God didn't create us for our best life. He created us for us to lay our lives down, to empty ourselves out in adoration and in sight of his mercy to him. He did it because he loved us. He did it because it was the will of the Father. Jesus was showing us that, that, that even he had to obey some rules. God in the flesh had to obey rules. And you think that nobody can tell you how you should live. Christ calls us to lay down our lives as well. In Luke 9, 23 and 24 says, uh, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, uh, the same will save it. It is a daily giving up of our uh, wants, our desires, our affections, uh, uh, our agenda. Uh, what text you want to preach on? That was for me. It's a daily giving up of your control of 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 your surroundings, of, uh, you know, how fast I can get to work. I mean, the traffic is just the, the most horrible thing because you feel like you're in control. You got a car. You're going to get to work. You got gas this time. <laughs> and I'm finally going to be on time. And then you got traffic. My brother's from Houston, so he knows all about that. But we get a little bit of traffic up here in Dallas, too. As a part of my physical education class, the district offers ballroom dancing as a component, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm 
one of the teachers. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I really love it. I love it. You know, we actually got first place last year. Uh, so um, this particular day, our other dance teacher uh, was wanting to show a DVD on various types of dances uh, that, that the classes would participate in for uh, the semester. So I had the, the AV cart. It was set up, and it has a projector and a DVD player on it. I noticed the instructor was having a little difficulty loading the disc into the DVD player. Uh, after frustratingly fidgeting around with it, you know when technology don't work, you, what's wrong with this? You know, I seen he was having some issues. And so I walked over there, and, uh, and he was saying, man, this thing was just working fine yesterday. You know, we just used it. You know, the projector's on. It's plugged in. You know, I, I don't get what, you know, what's going on with this thing. Sometimes technology acts foolishly. But I made it over to the cart, and as soon as I got there, he uh, chuckled. He said, oh, the power's not on. Yeah. All of that frustrating. All of that fidgeting and patting and hitting, and you haven't even turned on the power. How often do we stress out about various situations in our lives and we haven't checked to see if the power is on? How often do we complain about what we don't have and, 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 and circumstances that we're going through and, and we haven't even checked to see if the power is on? Believers, we only receive power when we lay down our lives. We only receive power when we lay down our goals, our agendas, in order to follow Christ. That's the only way we get our power, is when we lay it down. You may be plugged into a church, but is the power on? You may be plugged into a ministry, but is the power on? You may have gone to church your entire life, but is the power on? So many people have fallen away from the Christian faith because they've tried church, but they haven't tried Jesus for themselves. If you're listening or watching this, don't let that be you. Turn on your power. Turn on your power. Turn on your power. Verses 3 through 5, it says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of of Christ and God. Y'all know I love y'all, right? <laughs> this is a rough uh, passage, but you know what? When you love somebody, you know, you have the courage to tell them hard things. You know, and, and Christ loves us, and so uh, he's, he's telling them that the things that they're engaging in is only going to lead them out of their purpose, and it's going to lead them to miss out on the inheritance that's been so richly bought for us in Christ Jesus. We don't have to earn an inheritance. It's been given to us. And because we want to hold on to these fleshly desires and, 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 and the pleasures of the world around us, we can miss out on eternal life. Eternity is a long time to be wrong. It's a long time to be wrong. You can make a mistake, you know, and somebody may hold a grudge, you know. You know, sometimes we get grudges in marriage. I hold grudges against my wife, you know, but eventually, you know, you know, I forgive. But eternity is a long time to have to pay for that. And, 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 and Paul is encouraging us that you don't want to miss out on that. Point two, your actions show your allegiance. The characteristics stated in these three verses are indicative of the surrounding pagan culture. That's what the culture did. That's what the culture seen as a normative, uh, a, 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 a constant way of living that was accepted. 
All these were celebrated and they were, and they were widely practiced under Roman rule. They were free. If you were in Jerusalem, you'd be like, bro, you're about to get stoned. So. But in Ephesus, they were free to do all that stuff. They are addressed to people who had these habits and are now followers of Christ. Paul states the behaviors of concern two times, back to back in verses 3 and 5. He's making it plain that this is not something to overlook or take lightly. Because persisting in these behaviors like these as a part of your lifestyle is a good indicator that you may not be a true follower of Christ like you thought. That's something to think about. In Luke 11, verse 34 and 35, it says, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. So he's saying, you need to watch what you're watching. You need to watch what you're watching, not watch it, but be careful because what you're watching is a reflection of what's on the inside of you. And you may think that you are a follower of Christ, and you may think that you are walking in the light because you're here, or you're listening, or you're watching, you know, and You know, you may pay tithes or you may go to a great church. But take care lest the light in you actually turn out to be darkness. Paul wants you to be clear. It matters what we allow to constantly be before our eyes, to constantly have our attention. If we're not careful, we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're right with God when we're not. We... We've all had a past, okay? And I understand that. We all used to be an ex something. I've been all three of these things, uh, and, 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 and more of these things that were in these verses. Uh, just a transparent moment two of my main idols in my life have been sports and women. I had sex outside of marriage, and by the grace of God, not since being married, uh, I've I've been impure. Uh, it was a point in my life where I was a virgin, and, but I, I, I watched pornography and engaged in masturbation and, and, and lustful and perverted thoughts. That's my culture. Even at the age of 10. Perverted mind, lustful thoughts. Not innocent as I was presumed. Oh, you're so cute. Thank you. Perverted. Yeah. Wicked. Yeah. I've made sports and career achievements my sole priority before. You know, even up until, the, you know, a, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, having to make the decision between taking a job that's uh, uh, 20 grand more than what I'm making, and I can move out of this roach-infested apartment and get away from the gunshots and and, 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 and all this stuff that's causing stress in my life, but it would cause me to not be able to go to church like I wanted to during the week. It would cause me to not be available for my wife, which at the time we had uh, gotten married uh, and, and, and had been married for two years. And, and, and most of you who know or who are married know that year two is a very difficult year. It's very difficult, and we were on the brink of divorce, and I had to choose between getting this 20 grand or having time to pour into what was most important, which is my family, which is my wife, which is our spiritual life. We've all had a past. And these are still temptations that I have to turn from every day. Every day. Paul didn't have the Ephesian church moved out of that place. He reminded them of their created purpose while they were in that place. 
And that's what he's doing here. For some of you who are watching or listening, this is your current situation. Maybe that's still you. But how many people know that your current situation doesn't have to be your permanent destination? Your current situation doesn't have to be your permanent destination. When you surrender to Christ, your past has no bearing on your future in him. Now you belong to God, all of you, fully known, even the stuff you try to hide, fully known. But he deeply loves you. Christ deeply loves you. He loves all of you. He loves all of you, and he loves all of who you are as well. And he wants you to learn from him. He wants you to learn from him. He's completely aware of the culture that's around you. But you know what? When you surrender to Christ, it doesn't matter what's, what your location is. Christ can still control your destination with, with how you actuate following him. He can bring light to your darkness. That's within. This is good news to the sinner. This is good news to those who feel distant from God. Uh, that though we were far off, we've been drawn near by the blood of Christ. Thank God for Jesus, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for him. Verse 6, it says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 6 is a reminder of what Paul told them earlier in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Who is the prince of the power of the air? That's Satan. That's Satan. He is the God, little g, of this world. He's the ruler of this world. He is only here because he was kicked out of heaven. And now his only goal is to get more people to fall away from the Lord in any way he can. He was the one who tempted Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and to disobey God in the Garden of Eden. He uh, is still using the same tactics to deceive people today. He wants you to rebel against God by any means necessary. That means he's in control of the people who are uh, doing mass shootings and things. You know, I, mean, I mean, like the horrible things that we see, but he's also in control of those little sins, those little temptations, those second looks. Satan. It's the God of this world. And if, if he can't completely destroy your life, the enemy wants to limit your impact, limit your potential in Christ. If he can get a believer to fall into sin, he can get people to say, ain't nothing but a hypocrite. I ain't going to church. That's what they are. Put you in a box. Mar your name. Engaging in sinful acts that are affirmed by the world is not a sign of maturity. If you're not grounded in your purpose from the word of God, Satan will convince you that that that's that. I'm sorry. If you're not if if you're not grounded in the word of God, Satan will convince you that because uh it's popular that it's your purpose, that it's meant for you. Since it's popular, oh, this is what I should be. This is what I should have. This is what I should do. This is how I should live. Don't be deceived. Know your purpose. The only way you know your purpose is if you get into the word of God. Read the word of God. Live the word of God. The gospel gives light and clarity for any deception the enemy can try to tempt believers with. We cannot afford to take this lightly. We cannot afford to, to not turn our power on. We got to keep it on. If we fail to do this, Satan has the power to block our shine. 
hinder our realm of influence and destroy our testimonies. And I can't stand haters. I can't. You know, but if we fail to do that, that's, that's what we allow the enemy to do in our life. Verse 7, it says, therefore, because of all those things I said a second ago, don't become partakers with them. The Greek word for partners is metakos, which means to share in, in reference to companionship. You have a relationship with uh, this sin. He's saying don't be partakers with them. Christians should not join unbelievers in their sin. What's your relationship status with your sin? That's something to think about. You married to it? You married to the game? Married to the money? It's complicated. (laughs) Been there before. Or is it no longer in a relationship? That's what we should all aim to have. No longer in a relationship with our sin. We should be singing uh, that irreplaceable song that, that Beyonce was talking about. To the left, to the left. Put all of that stuff in the box and kick it to the left. Put sin to the left. Put all these temptation and these false desires, these false ideologies that's saying that this is your purpose. Put that in the box to the left. Jesus is irreplaceable. Do you know that? Your salvation is irreplaceable. Your position in Christ is irreplaceable. Don't take lust lightly. I want to share with you uh, something very sensitive to my heart. I had a dream that the Lord, uh, I believe, was using to speak to me. I shared this with my wife already. But uh, this was later this summer. I had a very vivid dream. It was, it was the most realistic dream I've had. And uh, basically, the dream is about an affair I had uh, with another woman. A dream. Um, Yes. In this dream, I assume that we met up at, I think it was like a high school reunion, and uh, it was a girl I recognized, but we never really talked, and so it threw me for a loop, like, why am I dreaming about this? But we're at the uh, party or the celebration, and we're just catching up. So we're talking, you know, everybody else is dancing, and, you know, we begin to talk, and I remember I feel like the feelings, like, man, this conversation is a good conversation. Um, and in the dream, it fast forward to a place where we could be alone and away from the party. And, uh, and um, for some reason, we end up going to my grandma's house. My grandmother's here, too. So. <laughs> And I'm going to ask God, like, why did you allow me to dream this? Like, why am I even at my grandmother's house? And as I, and as I began to think, uh, I went there in my mind because it's somewhere my wife wouldn't expect me to go with another woman. And so when we got there, sorry, Grandma, uh, we had something to drink, and I think, I think we got some coffee or something. And... Um, so we began to talk about old times, and, you know, we shared a kiss, and, uh, you know, what's going down is about to go down. And so I don't want to be too vivid, but, you know, sex happened, okay? And in my mind, I'm, I'm having an out-of-body experience in my dream and, and saying, like, man, I can't believe you're doing this. What are you doing, man? You, you, you really doing that? Oh, man. Uh, you tripping, bro. Uh, you know, and, and all this stuff. And so we get finished and put on our clothes, and I immediately begin to feel guilt in my dream. And I walk outside because, it's, you know, I, I, I got to get out. I'm feeling guilty. And I'm, I'm getting my keys. I'm ready to go to my car. I'm looking for my car, and I can't find it. 
I've been carjacked. My granny lives in Oak Cliff. Okay? And, and this is something that is very possible and, uh, of, of happening. So, I was carjacked. And the first thing I cried, I was like, ah, I've been carjacked, man. Now I got to tell my wife that the car's been jacked. I got to call the police. And they're going to ask me, okay, well, well, what were you doing over here this late? And, you know, asking me these questions. And, you know, my wife's probably going to interrogate me harder than what the police is. <laughs> you know, but I'm not yelling out, ah, oh, I just committed adultery. I'm talking about these material things. I'm talking about, ah, oh, what are people going to think? I'm thinking about how I look in the culture's eyes, in the people's eyes, but I'm not concerned or torn over offending my wife and offending God. That's what he showed me in my dream. And I thank God for it. I believe he allowed me to have that dream because you cannot take the lust in your life lightly. Yeah. 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 That's just one sin, but you definitely cannot take that lightly. In James chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's what sin does. That's what desire does when it's conceived, it gives birth to an action of sin, and it brings only death. What sin have you been allowing to grow in your life? That's something to think about. What sin have you been allowing to grow in your life? How long have you been struggling or dealing or allowing this sin to grow in your life, how close are you to death? That's something to think about. How close are you to death? Nobody knows. Don't take your opportunity to surrender to Jesus for granted. Because you never know when it's your time to go. You don't know when if, if you're going to get to, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for what I did. Please, please forgive me. You don't know if you're going to get the opportunity to say that or do that. People die in an instant. You never know. And so this is a lifestyle that Paul is encouraging them to live so that at any moment you will know that you can rest secure because you have been walking in the purpose in which you are created, not in a false reality in which you want it. Lust is desire out of context. You need desire for your spouse but the enemy of our souls wants us to take that and project that on other people that's how he tempts us no matter the size of the sin it still leads to death as I come to a close I'll end with this story um, it's about how I got up here. You may be wondering, man, God is working in his brother's life, and you know, what make him want to come and be a preacher all of a sudden? Well, man, the gospel is good news, and the Lord saved me. And he began to show me the abundant life that I can have peace, I can have joy just by obeying and following him. Um, but the Lord was wanting to do something greater in me. He wanted me to use my voice. He wanted me to be a voice of hope for people around me. And that wasn't what I was comfortable with doing. I was bound by fear. I was bound by anxiety of, you know, what people would think about me. Can y'all see me behind this thing? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, Man, this dude stuttered and he kind of lost me. I'm back on Instagram, so I forget what he's talking about. You know, stuff like that. 
Um, and it caused me to not even want to pursue what the Lord, I knew he was putting on my heart because of all these fears and anxieties. The Lord, the Lord revealed to me that even if you're involved in ministry, even if you're involved in church, even if you come to church and doing good things, even for the Lord, that you can still be walking in disobedience because you're not doing the thing that Christ is calling you to do. What is the thing that Christ is calling you to do? That's what you need to figure out. You know he's not calling you to go to the temple, so stop. But what is the thing that he's calling you to do in him? He's calling you to do something specific. He wants you to lay down that one thing. Getting up here and preaching before you was the last thing I want to do. It really was. But somebody somewhere needs to see your testimony. Somebody somewhere needs to see you living out your purpose because when they see you doing it, guess who else they can see doing it? They can see themselves doing it. And so it's time to wake up. It's time to live our lives for the glory of God. Our lives are not our own. Things function best when they're used in the purpose that they're created. Have you ever tried to open up a can good without a can opener? <laughs> I've tried that. And I got, I, got something, I got something that is supposed to be really good at opening things. I got a butcher knife. You know, it's sharp. You know, I'm sure it could get the job done. I probably won't spill all my SpaghettiOs everywhere. You know what? But when you use things outside of the purpose in which they're created, you can make a mess, and you can also bring harm to yourself. The same is true when you choose to live your life apart from the purpose in which you're created. Believers, we only receive power when we lay down our lives, our goals, our agendas to follow Christ. We're created in the image of God to reflect the glory of God for the people of God. I'm going to say that one more time. For we were created in the image of God to reflect the glory of God for the people of God. Somebody somewhere is depending on you to do what God is calling you to do. So let's walk in our purpose. Thank you. Amen. We can do better than that. Can we just give this brother a hand and stand? Okay, Dez, can you hang tight just a little bit, man? So couple of things before we head out. Number one, amazing word. Thank you for your diligence and study. Thank you for loving on us through the word. I'm listening to you, you know, speak. And one of the things just through your whole delivery that stood out to me is that one of the unique uh, graces, one of the unique powers of, of the gospel is that everyone has an opportunity to be saved. Uh, that no matter where you come from, no matter what you do, what your struggle or your story is, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. The challenge, though, is when we share the gospel as believers, as the church, uh, we, we oftentimes put up a facade. Uh, and we create a standard or a bar that people have got to live up to in order to be admitted into the community. One of the, uh, the values, one of the things that God has made very clear that he wants built into the DNA of our church body is that we would be a judgment-free zone, that there will be no condemnation, no shame, because we are all recovering something. Amen? So what, one of the things that God has made a priority for us is that we create a safe place for people to grapple with their sin and grow beyond it because when there is safety and love and affirmation uh, that is all based on the scriptures, that's where spiritual growth and discipleship uh, really takes place. Why am I sharing this right now? It's because as you were speaking, one of the things that really stood out to me is that you have um, a, a gifting with transparency. 
Um, and that is phenomenal. That's powerful. In the book of Revelations, it tells us that we overcome by the blood of the, of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So many people need to hear your story. And so many people will be blessed. So many people will be encouraged and built up simply because you are open enough to say, this is where I was, this is where I am, and this is where I'm headed. And so I just want to call that out in you. I want to affirm that and encourage you to continue in that way. I believe that that's going to be one of the unique ways that God is going to speak uh, through you and use you in ministry. You can, uh, you can set your, 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 your manuscript and your Bible down for a second. Um, I want to give you a charge. I want to charge you um, based on 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll read it in your hearing. I'm giving you this commission in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready to do it, whether it's convenient or inconvenient. Correct, confront, and encourage with patience and instruction. There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths, but you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances, endure suffering, do the work of a preacher of the good news, and carry out your service fully. So with that being said, I'd like to present you this morning an official certificate of license to preach. And I'll read this to you. This is to certify that Vincent Desmond Dotson, who has given evidence that God has called him to the gospel ministry, was licensed to preach the gospel as he may have opportunity and to exercise his gifts in the work of the ministry by Harvest Bible Fellowship Church at 206 James uh, uh, James Collins Boulevard in Duncanville on the 14th of October 2018. So, brother, now you got a license. You can preach all day long as you come. And we're going to invite you to do it as much as you can. So, just a couple of more things. We're moving to a close um, here. Um, so, I'm going to ask if Sherry will come up. Sherry is not one who likes to speak um, often. She's sitting to the side with our daughter, Ivy, who's the youngest one, who apparently has been whooping her head throughout service today. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sherry and I, we discussed was um, how when I was called into the preaching ministry, there was so much emphasis or encouragement that was directed towards me. And I know that in certain church traditions and church cultures, um, we tend to elevate the role of the male in ministry um, at the expense of overlooking uh, the women in their lives. The reality is this, when God calls you into ministry, he calls your wife into ministry and everybody else. And so as a body, we want to, amen, amen. Diamond, come on up here. Come on, come on. I know you ain't trying to get up here, but come on. Come on. Let's give her a hand. Come on. Come on. All right. So here is the thing. For the sake of time and because Sherry just really does not crave any stage of spotlight time, she has, and she told me to get out of the room because she was just, she wrote a book to you, I guess, about encouragement and things that she want to say for, to you as you guys embark upon this journey. I am so excited for what God is going to do through your family uh, because ministry starts with the family. Amen. And so for every bundle of joy that is born to this union, I believe that there is a covering and an anointing on every child and that as a family, you guys will continue uh, to be image bearers of God and to make his glory known to the world uh, simply in your obedience and surrender. So if Sherry wants to give that, do you want to say anything? Have you changed your mind? Okay, she actually does. Uh oh, y'all. Here we go. He said, actually. <laughs> no, Diamond, I just want to really encourage you and I just wanted to uh, tell you that we love you. Like Reverend Darrell was saying, that when your husband's called, you were also called, and God has predestined this thing since before you were born. So you guys are meant to be together. You're supposed to be here in this moment. And I just want to um, continue to encourage you, let you know I continue to pray for you. And we have our conversations here and there, and I just love your heart 
and just your generosity and just everything that you do, that God is truly using you and developing and growing you and both of you. And so I just want to continue just to tell you that we love you. God is not, that God is definitely building something unique and special within your ministry as husband and wife, and that this is just the beginning. So I am so excited about what's to come. So again, like he said, I did put a whole book in the card that I put in here, but just some um, notes and some things just moving forward um, as the Lord has called you to a new season. And just want to let you know that I love you and that we're here. So you guys, you have to excuse Sherry has been down sick all week, struggling with a hoarse voice. But I got to tell you, I think that raspy voice is kind of cute. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get home. All right. So one more thing. So I really had every intent to pray over you guys. But one of the things that the Lord really impressed upon my heart while we were sitting there is that as a body, we want to affirm. And uh, we want to confirm the calling that God has on you in the preaching ministry and on your family as you continue to serve here among the HBFC family and however the Lord elevates and gives you assignment. So um, I like to do two things. Uh, they were not, well, one was not prepared. I didn't get a chance to talk earlier, but I'm going to ask if Reverend Pat will come. And if he would pray over you, Diamond, and I'm going to ask if Miss Alberta, will you come uh, to pray over Diamond? And while they're coming to do so, uh, we have mom and dad Dotson who are here. Will you guys stand? We definitely uh, do not want, yeah, let's give them a hand as well. And we have Sister Smith, his grandmother, she's here as well. He wouldn't have been here without her either. So yeah, that's awesome. If the two of you would like to come down, if there are any words that you want to share with them, we want to give you a, a moment to do so. If you don't have anything you want to say publicly, there's no pressure. But if you do, we want to give you that opportunity. You guys, come on. Is that a yes, a no, or maybe you do? Awesome. Just briefly, I want to just publicly thank God. He is a prayer answering God. He's a covenant keeping God. And I just want to encourage every mother, every wife, every grandmother, whatever prayer God is putting in your heart for your children, your grandchildren, keep praying. Prayers don't die. They live. God bless you. Amen. As a father, I'm certainly thankful to God for, for calling my son to the ministry, but when Pastor Pryor heard me call my ministry, he said, now, he said, you've made the call, so you're going to have to sustain the call, and I'm so thankful to God that, that I know that my son is a preacher, because he's been preaching to me for a long time. <laughs> I remember that day when, when uh, he was sleepwalking, and I just try, kind of pointed him to the right direction. I told him, wasn't nothing wrong with it, son. God has a purpose for everything that he does, and he's going to use this very thing. And you talked about it today. And I just want to thank God. I wasn't never going to tell anybody. But, <laughs> but I, I thank God for you, and you know I love you. We've had those night talks and those times we, we cried together, and I tried to encourage you as you encouraged me. So I'm just thankful to God because, you know, in God, Amen. There's no bounds. And I just, I just want to thank God for all that he's doing and all he's going to do. Amen. Amen. I love you, man. All right. All right. Thank you. Bro. So as we move to pray, any who would like to stretch your hands forward as a sign of agreement, uh, we welcome you to do so. Desmond and Diamond, if you guys will come, I'm going to shift on this side because we're getting a little heavy on the edge here, but we just want to cover them um, as a church family. Let us bow together, family. Father God, we lift up this couple today, this vessel that you selected to pour into us. Father God, we pray and ask that you remind them both the charge and the task that you've laid upon them. Lord, um, I pray for my brother in the ministry, Desmond, that you will remind him of Philippians 1 and 6 to be confident in this thing that you have placed in him, that you will complete it until the day of Christ. We pray, dear Lord God, that those times when it's hard to even preach, when it's hard to hear from you, when, when things are just cloudy, 
things are heavy at home, things are heavy at the workplace, that you remind him, Lord, that you are right there with them. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would continue to just guard their hearts and their minds in you, Lord God, so that they will not only just be transparent, but, Lord God, they will continue to just walk out and live a life of integrity before your people and before yourself. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, um, for how you have equipped them and how you will sustain them. Our prayer, Lord God, is to not just only pray here today for them, but to continue to pray for them. Lord, even, Lord, as they um, continue to go on in ministry for you. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We trust you. And we pray, oh God, that, Lord, that you will continue to use um, Desmond, Lord, and Diamond, Lord God, to continue to just minister to those, Lord, whom you will send. Lord, um, we thank you again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, in continuing in prayer, I lift um, specifically Diamond to you as the wife in this union, Lord God. And yes, sir. I just pray, Lord, that you would crown her with your wisdom yes, and your knowledge in being a wife of a, a one called to the ministry, oh God. Not that he is called alone, but that she is called alongside. Yes, Lord. Lord, just as your word tells us that every wife is called alongside, Lord God, to complement, not to complete, but to continue, Lord God, the work that you began in yes. both of them. We pray, Father God, that um, she would wear this position that you have called her to in the ministry with joy, yes. with um, complete submission, Lord God, to you first, Father, yes. that she would submit to prayer, Lord God, when it seems that things are are not going as she would wish, Lord God, but that she would be reminded, not my will, but yours be done, O oh God. Yes. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would do a mighty work yes. in and through her, in and through him as a couple, uh, in and through them, O oh God. We pray, Father God, that, um, that they would, um, as the Bible tells us, that they would step back, Lord God, so you could step forward. Amen. That they would do more together in this ministry yeah. than they could do separately and apart. Yeah. Father God, honor their marriage vows. Honor their marriage bed. Help them to see, Father, that um, it is you and you alone yes. that is leading the way. And they are followers, Lord. Followers of you. Followers of the gospel. Living a life, Heavenly Father, that can be an example to those that um, you send across their path. We ask, oh, Father, that um, this ministry that you have birthed in them would be multiplied, yes. that it would magnify you, and that, Lord, that you would get the glory. Yes. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.